Hello everyone, my name is Stephen Palacini and I'm a licensed immigration professional here in Canada with the College of Immigration and Citizenship Consultants and I wanted to read an open letter that I've sent to the Minister of Immigration, the Honorable Sean Fraser. Um, I've sent him this letter, I have yet to receive a response and I wanted your, uh, your thoughts on this. IRCC is failing Canadians and newcomers miserably. Dear Minister Fraser, as a Canadian citizen and licensed immigration professional with a practice in Canada, I'm writing today to express my deep concerns with the current state of affairs in your ministry, Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. I, like most Canadians, expressly favour Canada's present and historical meritocratic immigration policy that has helped grow Canada into one of the best nations in the world to earn a living, start a business, grow a family or seek refuge. Our citizens' favoritism and encouragement of international migration is something that Canadians like myself are proud of and we hold dear to our hearts. It is part of our identity as Canadians. Canada is known worldwide as the country that admits the best and brightest from around the world through a meritocratic, competent, and compassionate system. We understand that our country was built by immigrants. We are all immigrants. It is a heavily nonpartisan issue. Immigrants and a robust immigration policy are favored overwhelmingly in this country. This is something many other developed countries cannot lay claim to. In the words of our Prime Minister and your House leader, Justin Trudeau, diversity is our strength, and most Canadians, regardless of political stripes, truly do believe this. However, in recent years, there appears to have been a rapid departure from this once proud cornerstone of Canadian identity. My main source of infinite frustration and that of many of my colleagues and your stakeholders in having to deal with IRCC would be the sheer incompetence and absence of basic customer service that should be expected from any marginally effective government department, especially one as critically important and, sig and as significant as yours. These continued failures are damaging our reputation as a country abroad and at home. The once overwhelmingly fair and competent IRCC has rapidly descended into an incompetent, unfair, and increasingly opaque department, lacking even the most basic communication skills that would be expected in the 21st century, processing competence, and the absence of accountability that we as law-abiding, tax-paying Canadians have a right to expect. Some days I ask myself, what is the point in even trying to help someone in calling Canada home? God forbid they are from a visa-required country because at this point, it's like playing Russian roulette with an applicant's future in the processing uncertainty of their application. There is zero accountability when the processing time exceeds your own set service standards. And when it so often does, it happens in the absence of any sort of basic and constructive non-boilerplate two-way communication with your department. If you've gotten this far reading, or in the case of YouTube, listening, I thank you for your attention and would like to elaborate on these main points of frustration and critical failures in the department. Accountability and communication. There are many I could focus on, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick these two main ones. I believe your department needs to address these failures immediately to preserve the integrity of our immigration system and the reputation of our country. Number one, communication. There is currently zero two-way communication with your ministry. Officers, managers, supervisors, or even client services. Isn't that the whole point of client services? Everyone from representatives like myself and clients have lost confidence in calling the immigration line. Web form submissions always seem to fall on deaf ears if they work, and communication with a reviewing officer is essentially impossible. Even recently, it has come to my attention that IRCC has made it even more challenging now for MPs, Member of Parliament offices, to obtain information on the processing state of an application when inquiring on behalf of a constituent in their riding or a future constituent. Communication matters because opening these lines of communication would automatically make the process more efficient, reduce officer mistakes and miscommunications, errors, and indecision. Why do we even bother to put a phone number or email address on the application when it is never contacted and only used as a notification tool? 
Why even ask for that information? The whole point of communication is to help facilitate understanding. And when so many applications are being refused for reasons that are not understandable or explained with timelines that are extended by a factor of 10, it becomes unbearable and refused in principle for the applicant and representative alike. The alternative of court-based judicial review for, IRS, for when IRCC officers err in the evaluation of an application only adds to the backlog. Processing delays, expenses to update now expired documents because of ridiculous timelines, and additional timelines the applicant has already suffered from. So when an application is refused for reasons that are not clear or substantiated by the officer in the refusal letter, it's begging for a reapplication. Now, I'm sure you can imagine how reapplications further contribute to the growing processing backlog, don't you? It is beyond me that the officer's reasons for refusing the application are not automatically appended to the refusal letter. Why would you want to create another step for somebody who wants to call Canada home, either temporarily or permanently, in requesting ATIP GCMS notes? This just contributes to the communication backlog, and it certainly doesn't pay for itself in terms of the government work involved with the nominal $5 fee. As an effective model of communication, perhaps you should look to the provinces and their PNP officers. They've made it possible for applicants and representatives to communicate on the phone and by email with their officers. It only makes sense that this should be possible with IRCC reviewing an application. At a minimum, IRCC should be accountable to communicate with applicants and their representatives, if applicable, when IRCC has failed to adhere to their own processing service standards. In essence, when IRCC fails to provide the service they were paid for in the time they were supposed to, isn't it only right that a task force aims to get that application processed and update the client or representative through meaningful communication? Look to the province's immigration programs for communication ideas. Consider delegating a task force on backlogged applications to communicate with the applicants and representatives when your department fails to provide the service paid for within the specified service standard. Consider the applicants and representatives as human beings, not as inanimate objects. They are just as human as you, your department, and the IRCC officers, and for that reason, applicants deserve a meaningful, humane means of communication and response. Let the officers append the real refusal reason to the letter to save the applicant time and increase your efficiency as a department. Secondly, and finally, in the case of this letter, accountability in regards to processing times. As you are aware, there are roughly 2.5 million applications in process in backlog at the time of drafting this letter. As a reminder, your publicly published service standards for temporary resident applications, such as visitor visas, are supposed to be 14 days, one, four, two weeks for a TRV, 60 days for a work permit from outside the country, and 60 days for a study permit. Yet right now, applicants from many countries have been waiting over a year for a decision on their TRV applications. This is not a joke, a bad dream, or a nightmare. It is the reality of IRCC today. It's apparent there is no priority given to applications that have exceeded the processing standard. A processing time of 63 weeks from Pakistan is abhorrent, and I'm aware of an applicant on his 15th, likely now 16th month, waiting for a decision on his work permit. Not only has he suffered by waiting with zero communication, but the Canadian business has suffered without his needed expertise. The Canadian employer needed him 15 months ago. Are you aware of the damage a 15 month absence of an employee, a key employee can do to an operational business? How about a visitor visa from the Philippines for a family reunification that's been in process for over 500 days? That's over one and a half years of an applicant's life and that of her family here in Canada, which they've spent apart unnecessarily. The standard is 14 days, to remind you. To reference communication once again, there's been absolutely none on the file from IRCC. 
Put yourself in the shoes of the family. How would you manage being separated from your partner or child for over 500 days in the hands of a dysfunctional bureaucracy with no communication or corrective action available to you? Another example I'd like to make you aware of was a dying Canadian mother's wish to see her son one last time. There was no response from IRCC, of course, and no decision until after the mother had passed. The thought of a mother's dying wish having no way of being granted due to processing delays is sickening and should sicken everybody. The fact there is no way to expedite even the most urgent situations from an applicant or representative's point of view is dysfunctional, to say the least. The timelines are so grossly extended at this point that there's a statistically significant chance that many applicants may die before your department even processes their application. This is the case when a large number of your decisions are taking 1-5% to of the remaining time of an applicant's lifespan if they are from a subset of certain countries, and this is not right. Canadians, Canadian employers, PRs, and foreign nationals require temporary resident decisions in weeks, not years, Minister. The processing times must be addressed with meaningful solutions. Applications should be opened within your service standards, and when they aren't, there needs to be someone delegated to them, possibly many of the additional 3,000 staff hired to make sure these standards are respected. And when they are not, the client deserves meaningful communication and action. I do believe in a paid priority processing stream, as is the case in many other developed countries. With these resources going directly to paying for the expedited processing and reducing the burden on the regular processing stream. Our passport office has managed this. Can it not be deployed within your department? Sometimes in life, time is priceless. And in the case of a visa to Canada, when the applicant has no other alternative and when money doesn't matter because time is critical, they need certainty and accountability. An expedited stream could have granted that mother her dying wish, and I'm sure her son would have rather paid to have those final moments than wait in uncertainty until it was too late. Your communication team has the Immigration Matters campaign, hashtag Immigration Matters, and my recommendation is that you act like it does. We're exhausted of talking points, and we need decisive action on accountability with processing times and communication. Canadians as a whole understand the benefit of immigration. So focus on the pinch point and what applicants, families, and businesses are truly suffering from. Process the applications within your set service standards and communicate with clients and representatives because we are just as human as you. Work permits, study permits, and visitor visas need decisions in single digit weeks, not years. Thank you for reading and listening to this letter. For a glimpse into understanding my frustrations and that of my colleagues, clients, Canadians, and newcomers alike. I trust that you will take this letter seriously and can understand the unacceptable nature of these problems plaguing IRCC and the gravity of the current situation, which has generated unnecessary financial and emotional suffering for applicants and their families. Canadians and businesses in Canada. If you need further context, Minister, um, or would like to discuss these issues in greater detail, I will gladly make myself available for you and your department to help solve these issues. I know my colleagues would also appreciate raising their concerns as well. I'm available to support you and your department by any means necessary to facilitate decisive action to fix these problems and mitigate the suffering faced by Canadian families, our businesses, and newcomers to this great country. Sincerely, Stephen Palacini.